this is take two on this video. I actually just did a 10 minute video on this and I just didn't feel like it came across good. I'm feeling a little habit today. So let me, let me get to the point and try to not uh, go on too long about this. Uh, comments on one of my previous videos where I'm talking about Android phones versus other phones um, and basically how if you can unlock an Android phone, uh, unlock the bootloader, you pretty much have control over it. And I also talk about how uh, Android phones and phones in general in my opinion, aren't very secure because they don't really ask you for passwords except for when you, you know, passcode to log in. Um, but when it comes to doing stuff, it it asks you, can this program do that? And I think that's silly. But let's let's read the some of the comment from this gentleman. He says, how is it better to type a password to authorize an app to use your camera? He goes on to talk about how it just doesn't seem like secure to have to type your password over and over and over again. And that is not what my point was. My point was, okay, there's certain systems. When Windows Vista came out, for example, Windows Vista came out, and every program you ran, it's like, this program's trying to run. Is that okay? Which is just stupid and annoying to ask, because, yeah, it's okay, because I ran it. And also, how is it secure to have an okay button? Anyone can okay button, that's not security. So part of my point is, don't tell me or ask me, hey, this program's going to use the camera. Is that okay? unless I'm gonna type in some sort of password to approve it, because an OK button is not security. Either go one way, either, either just let everything do everything or require me to give something permission. Don't go down the middle of the road, that's not real security, that's, that's fake security to make you feel good. But let's talk about permissions for a moment. Again, on a phone, there's really no permissions like on a desktop Linux system or a Unix system or some you know Unix-like systems uh, that are out there. So. On a desktop computer, you may not realize this, you're a user, and you might have to do sudo or login as root to do some more advanced things, but the things you can do, and there's a lot of different things you can do, is because you're part of a group, and you can look and see what groups your user is part of. And so it's, it's, not, it's silly to have a piece of software and say, this software is allowed to do this, and this software is allowed to do this, in my opinion. It's, can this user do it? Can Chris? Is Chris allowed to do this? And that might seem, you know, if you have just a computer at your house and it's your own personal computer and you're the only user, that, that might seem a little silly. But when you have a multi-user system, which Linux and Unix-like and Unix-based systems are, they're multi-user systems, you need to have these permissions. And let me give you, sometimes it might seem a little silly, some of these permissions, but when you really think about it, there's reasons for them. For example, on most computers nowadays, nowadays you don't set your clock. Your, your clock goes to a server. There's a, a client running in the background of your machine. It goes to a server. It gets the time and it updates your clock regularly, making sure that it stays in sync with that server. But I can tell you, back, you know, 13 years ago when I first started using Linux, a lot of the distros, you go to the clock settings and you couldn't modify the time without logging in as root or sudo or doing something like that. The regular user couldn't change the clock. I'm not sure how it is on modern dating systems. Again, I don't do it very often because my computer automatically syncs with a server. Why would you not be able to set the clock on your computer? Maybe I want to set it, you know, for a different time for whatever reason. Well, from a business standpoint, from a, a, a multi-user standpoint, that could be uh, very detrimental to your, your, your business. And I'm going to give you an example of a story. It's an old story. Uh, I, I might not get all the details exactly right, but the general idea of it, I think it was Captain Zap. Look him up, Captain Zap. He was a hacker back in the day, back in, I believe, the 80s. And um, back then, he found connection to a server. The server was owned by some phone company. I don't remember what phone company or if they say in the story. He got in because, I believe, because he just tried for the username guest and the password guest, and he was logged in. And he snooped around for a little bit, and supposedly the only thing he really did was change the clock of the server from a.m. to p.m. So whatever time it was, let's say it was 6 p.m., he switched it so it's at 6 a.m. or the other way around. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it cost the, 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 the phone provider lots and lots of money because it took them a couple of weeks to figure this out until bills started going out. Because you see, back in the day, there were things called peak hours when it came to phone usage. And especially if you're making you know, long-distance phone calls, um, if you called someone during the day, it was more expensive than if you called in the middle of the night in off-peak hours. Well, he just flipped the time around on the server. So for weeks, everyone who was making phone calls during the day was getting a discount on their calls, and the people at night were getting charged too much, but no one realized it until the bills went out. 
And that was just a big mess. And all he did was change the clock from AM to PM. So there's an example. I don't know what group you need to be part of, uh, what the group is called on a Linux system, but there is a group you need to be part of if you want to change the clock. You also remember changing the clock is actually changing st settings on your motherboard because your motherboard keeps track of your time. And so that's some access that you want to have secure. And here's another example that, that a lot of you may have come across. So I get a lot of people talking about how they go to use an Android, or not Android, uh, an Arduino. And they um, go to plug in their Arduino, they start up the Arduino IDE, and then they go to upload it, and it says they don't have permission. So a lot of people end up doing sudo to start the Arduino interface, which you shouldn't do. That's not what you're supposed to do. So when you hook your Arduino to your USB port, it's actually converting it from a USB to a serial port. So it's a serial port connection. To communicate through serial port connection, you need to be part of the serial port group, which is called, I believe, dial-up, either dial-up or dial-out. Uh, and I'm assuming it's called that because back in the day, you would hook up your modem to the serial port. You would hook up a lot of devices to your serial port. So to communicate with other devices and other computers and get online back in the day, you had to connect through the serial port. And you have to think about the security aspect of that is now you're hooking up your machine to other devices that are communicating with it. You don't want just any user being able to do that. So that carries over. It's a serial port connection when you hook up to, because the Arduino itself, if you have the USB plug on it, actually has a USB to serial adapter in it. Or you have one that doesn't and you're using a USB to serial adapter. So all you have to do is add yourself to the uh, dial up or dial out. I think it's dial up group. So, you know, you would sudo and then there's a command. Uh, it's like change group or add group. I, I don't even remember off the top of my head this user to dial up group. And then yet that user has to log out and log back in. And then you can start up the Arduino interface and access the serial port. It isn't giving the Arduino interface access to serial port. You as a user have permission to use that serial port. So any program you start should be able to access that serial port. So you see how that works? It's, it's not this software has permission. It's because you should trust the software on your machine. So if you don't trust your software on machine, that's, that's your first problem. But you should trust your software. Your software shouldn't be doing anything malicious. So your next concern is the users on your machine, and you want to restrict users when you have multiple users. You, you may, you know, not want certain people changing certain settings, settings on your machine. So that was the first question that person asked. And the second question he, or comment he says, uh, I mentioned uh, in the other video where, you know, a quick way to check, and this isn't the only way, it's just a quick way, a rule of thumb for me, is to find a project, and I gave Lineage OS as an example, which is a community-based Arduino um, project, go to a project like that, look at their list of devices. If your device is on that list or you're looking to buy a device and it's on that list, that pretty much means that you can unlock the bootloader. If you can unlock the bootloader of a device, you own that device. You can then root it with ease, you can change the operating system, um, but if it's on that list, in theory, you should be able to unlock the bootloader, otherwise it wouldn't be on that list, it wouldn't be supported. But his point is, he says, you know, having a phone that has Lineage OS um, at the time of purchase doesn't really mean that it's always going to be supported. He gave an example of the Motorola G4, uh, and I have a Motorola G, I can't, this might be a Motorola G4, it might be a Motorola G2, I think it was, it might have been a, yeah, it's one of those two. Anyway, and I have Lineage on that, but I haven't updated in a while. But yeah, he's right, Lineage um, no longer supports that. And my point wasn't that find it on the list of a project and that project is always going to support it. That was not my point at all. My point was, if it's on a project like that, that means you can unlock the bootloader which means that you personally have control of that device. Doesn't mean that there's always gonna be somebody there to help you or do it for you. It'd be nice to think that Lineage OS is gonna support all devices forever, but it's just unrealistic. But the truth is, you can get the Arduino, or sorry, the Android source code, because Arduino Android is free and open source software under the GPL and Apache license. So you can compile Arduino Android yourself and put it on your phone, you know, and you have to know where to put the drivers and stuff like that. And have I ever done that? No, I thought about doing it once and I had to download like 50 gigs worth of source code. And I was like, no, no, I'm not going to bother with that. So my point was not that there will always be people there to help you because there won't. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you're going to want to do something. But the point is, if you can unlock the bootloader of your phone, um, you pretty much have control over that phone. You can root it and update it. It just might be a lot of work on your part but it's still that freedom of being able to do that. Uh, so yeah, it's not that it's going to be easy or that it's always going to be supported by other people, but if you can unlock the bootloader, uh, then 
you have somewhat control of your device. You might have to learn and do some work, though. So anyway, this video was just as long as the last, but I feel like maybe I did a little better. I don't know. Anyway, I thank you for watching, and I hope that you have a great day.